Okay, great. Thank you all for joining. Uh, where's that? There you go. So real quick, um, usually we would do some sort of networking time, like I just mentioned. Um, really difficult to do when we're all virtual, but we'll figure out how to do it. Um, hopefully by the next month, so we can at least get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself for a little bit. Uh, well, actually, we don't have a sponsor for tonight's session, so we'll be skipping that and jumping right into Andrew's topic. Um, so real quick, my name is Dave Losey. Uh, I'm a solution principal at Slum Consulting here in Boston. Um, we started this group this year uh, with the hopes of kind of just expanding the uh, DXM, the DXP, DXT, the digital experience management space uh, within the Boston market. Um, I, I've been with Slalom for just over seven years now. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of the Boston Office 365 user group, which has been uh, wildly successful. And I'm hoping to kind of carry some of what, of what we did there over to uh, this group here. Um, we also uh, just got a COVID puppy, so I have to show her off. Her name's Millie Ray. Um, and she's an eight month old Dalmatian, she's very cute. Uh, and that's it about me. Um, we are looking for another co-organizer or two, someone to kind of help help with this group and organizing it and um, outreach and finding speakers and all that stuff. So if anyone is interested here, please feel free to reach out to me. My, con my contact info is there. Um, my email address is not there though, so I apologize for that, but you can find me on Twitter or hit up my website. I think that has my email on it as well. Um, and without further ado, we're going to switch over to uh, Andrew's topic, SEO in a DXM world. Great. Great. Thanks. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Great. Great. So good evening, everybody. Um, uh, I'm really glad you guys could all join us tonight. Um, as David said, my name is Andrew Holstein. I'm a digital experience management consultant with Slalom Boston. Uh, and while I currently specialize in marketing technology, I actually started my career in SEO. And the reason I wanted to talk to you guys today about SEO is that when we talk about digital experience management, we talk a lot about how users engage with our website, as we should, it's incredibly important. And we also talk a lot about how our internal users engage with the tools that we use to govern those sites, which is also great. But we rarely talk about how search engines engage with our sites. And while I still prioritize the human user experience over the search engines, they still have an, a significant impact on our business. Um, and there are a lot of things that we as digital experience professionals can do to help drive tangible business results in SEO. Uh, because at the end of the day, a great user experience doesn't do much for us without users. Um, so today I want to dive into how we can optimize search engine for search engines within DXM. Um, if you ever want to reach out to me to chat about SEO, PC, marketing option, any of these great things, uh, please do. Um, and though I don't have an eight-week-old puppy, uh, my buddy here, Herbie, is also always open to uh, a few new Instagram friends. So I will not blame you. And you would rather talk to him than me. Uh, so today I want to talk first about why SEO matters. Um, I want to go through some of the um, on-page and off-page ranking factors and then talk a little bit about how we can impact SEO within our MarTech stacks. Um, so first off, SEO. Uh, so I would say SEO is essentially just finding the right keywords that are going to drive quality traffic to your site and then getting your site to rank as highly as possible for those keywords. And it's big business. 93% um, of the experiences begin with the search engine and two thirds of one of the top five organic results. Uh, and also SEO tends to um, convert at a much higher rate than typical outbound leads, which ultimately makes sense because you're getting your website in front of people right as they're looking for your product or services. Uh, it's kind of like having a milk cart outside of a peanut butter store. You know people that are coming out of there are looking for exactly what you have. Um, and those spots are so lucrative that businesses paid $98 billion last year to try to get to the top of those results pages uh, through Google search ads. But we also know that about 80% of people ignore paid search results. So that makes those organic rankings that much more valuable for a business. Uh, and just tying it back to, to seeing, and website launches, um, I think 
in my experience, when launching a new site, one of the best ways to make your stakeholders happy is to show them that the new site is generating more traffic and often comes to uh, just improving over what you had previously. Uh, so setting it up correctly can make a big difference and a big impact on your business and the funding you get for your next project. And converse up incorrectly can have some pretty bad negative effects uh, because your CMO never wants to go to the board and try to explain why their shiny new website uh, gets less traffic, even though it looks great and works great. Uh, to, to state the obvious, Google rules search. So tonight I'm going to mostly talk about Google, but just know that everything I talk about that applies to Google will also apply to other search engines like Google or Bing and, or DuckDuckGo, um, which can drive some traffic, but generally what works for Google works there too. So I'm going to use Google as a uh, proxy for search engines. And when working in SEO, I always find it helpful to keep Google's mission statement in mind because they've generally held true to this, at least in the search area. Um, I'm not sure if this really applies to self-driving cars, but I'm not going to judge their business model. Uh, but keeping this in mind as, as a guiding strategic light where we want to make useful information that's easily accessible is generally going to help us rank better in SEO. And diving into Google's ranking algorithm, it's a lot like the Coca-Cola recipe in that the exact recipe is one of the more heavily guarded secrets in, in the United States, but we still have a pretty good idea of what goes into it. And generally, we divide those factors into two types. We have off-page factors, which largely we can't control, although sometimes we can't try to influence them. And then on-page factors, which we can control because we control our own websites. Uh, we're going to focus mostly today on the on-page factors because that's what most of us as digital experience professionals can make an impact on without adding a full-time SEO professional role to our long list of job responsibilities. Uh, but it's important to be familiar with some of those uh, more critical off-page factors. Um, so I want to start off with a few of those SEO factors because if you gave an SEO presentation and didn't mention backlinks, did you really give an SEO presentation at all? Um, so at a high level, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, domain authority. And when I say that, I mean, Google wants to rank the most useful information from the most trustworthy sources. So they assign authority to domains. And really, it's a proxy for how qualified is your site to deliver quality information about the topic being searched for. And Google has hundreds of ways that they use to determine your domain authority. One of the most uh, important ones is actually your on page performance in your site history. Um, so um, when your links show up in Google search results, do people click on it? Uh, when they click on them, how long do they stay on your site? Or are they bouncing back to the search results and clicking on something else? Uh, how long are they staying on your site? How many pages are they clicking through on your site? Um, and it's important to note that anyone that's browsing your site using Google Chrome, Google can track how much they're doing on your site and see what uh, how much of their content you're consuming. Uh, and that's one of the reasons they, they created Chrome in the first place. So that ties back to our user experience and how that actually has a, a pretty dramatic impact on SEO uh, because if users are finding value in the site, then Google will prioritize it in the search results. Uh, backlinks are kind of a big deal. Uh, they're far and away the number one way Google determines if a site is relevant to search. Uh, Google is Google because they came up with the concept of using backlinks to rank uh, pages in their search results. So they essentially consider each link to your site as a vote for the value of that page, that that person who is linking to you thinks that your content is worth sharing with people that have come to their site. So the more votes you get for your site, the more authority you gain. And the type of link matters also uh, because the more authoritative or more relevant the site that's linking to you is, the more that link is worth. Um, links from .edu or .gov or .org sites are more valuable because they're generally more trustworthy sources. Uh, links that will that specifically mention your keyword are worth more because they're more relevant. Um, and links within the content of a page, as opposed to among a, a list of other links like a like a resource page, uh, are going to be worth more. Uh, whereas on the other side, user generated content like social media or comment sections on a blog are going to be worth very little 
because anyone can put that link there. So there's very little trust in that source. Uh, but while those social links don't have direct value to SEO, um, when done in scale, they can temporarily boost your rankings. Um, and the same thing with press releases. So for example, when you know everyone and their mother is tweeting about Popeye's chicken sandwiches, they're gonna get an SEO boost for people searching for chicken sandwiches. Uh, but when that hype train slows down, so do their rankings. Uh, and last, um, because Google knows us better than we know ourselves, they factor our own profiles and, and search histories into their, into their rankings. Uh, whether that's the device you're using, your location, your recent search history, et cetera, um, all of that factors into what they're going to offer you in turn, uh, when you search for something. Uh, so for example, someone who searches the term breakfast on their phone at eight in the morning um, is more likely to see a result maybe around local breakfast options than if that same person searched breakfast from their desktop at three in the afternoon, where maybe they get breakfast recipe ideas for the weekend, something like that. Um, so all of these things matter and we don't necessarily have much control over them. Um, we can try to influence things like social media and, and links back to our site, um, but ultimately this kind of stuff is dependent on the quality of the content and information that we're putting out there. That brings me to the on-page factors. And if you wanna learn more about some of those off-page factors, we've scraped about 1% of the, um, the, the depths that is off-page SEO. Um, and if you want to learn more, I would highly recommend trying Google. Uh, but today, looking more into these on-page SEO factors, because this is what we can control, because we have control over our own websites, and they still have a very significant impact on our rankings. Uh, so we're going to go through these, and, uh, for the most part, in the order of their importance in the impact they can have on our rankings. The first up is keyword relevance. Uh, we can control the content on our own page. And obviously making sure that content's actually good and usable and valuable is the most important thing we can do. Um, and Google will actually penalize thin, poor content. Um, and that's generally something we let our, our marketing teams and our content teams control. But there are certain things that we can do within the content of a page concerning where we place keywords that can help search engines determine what our pages are relevant to. Uh, we can help our content creators by enabling them to make sure that those key areas uh, are filled out and have the keywords they're supposed to in them. Um, so those places are list, listed on the left-hand side here in order of importance. Uh, the easiest one is always gonna be your root domain. Um, for example, if you have pizza.com is always going to rank well for the term pizza. Um, obviously most of us can't just go change our domain names. Uh, we all have a lot of money invested in our branding, so it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, but the, the rest of the URL after the, the root domain also matters. Um, so the subdirectories we use, the, the names that we give to our pages uh, can have an impact on our SEO rankings. And in general, the closer the keyword is in your URL to the root domain, the more valuable it is. Uh, so just throwing it onto the, the end of a, a long URL isn't gonna help nearly as much as if you have pizza.com slash pepperoni, and that's your pepperoni page. Uh, next, your page title and meta descriptions are the first place a crawler is going to look to determine what a page is about. Um, and while they are in the head section of a, of a site and are generally not visible to users, they're primarily there for bots, there are a few places that those show up. Uh, a title is usually seen in the title bar of your browser, and then both the title and meta description are used in the uh, listing in your, your search results pages. Um, so including relevant keywords here is really important, but you also need to take this as a chance to convince the searcher that they should be clicking on your page instead of someone else's. So you need to find a way to make it both compelling for a user to click on and also relevant to your keyword so that the uh, search uh, crawlers will know what your page is about. Um, headers also can play a big role. Um, H1 tags are the most valuable, um, then H2 tags, then H3 tags. Um, but you can't take a shortcut and just start using all H1 tags all over your site. The more you have, the less valuable each one is. And Google generally wants to see a consistent structure of you know, an H1 tag first, then an H2 tag, then an H3 tag, um, so that they know you're not trying to mess with their system to try to stuff some keywords in. Um, and generally, you always want to do what makes sense from a, a usability and a readability standpoint. So I would say don't go crazy on your headers, but um, 
you know, when you're looking at something like maybe bolding a header instead of um, using an H tag, maybe that's an opportunity for you to change that to an H tag. Uh, and the last thing I want to specifically call out is alt tags uh, for images. Um, because Google, while Google's gotten significantly better at analyzing what an image is, uh, it's still a lot more difficult for them to do, and they're not going to do it for every page they find. Uh, so giving Google an easy way to tell what a, an image is, is going to be beneficial and help you get some of the relevant content from that image and uh, make sure that that bot is able to read that. Uh, my general rule of thumb here is just make sure you're writing for humans first because how people interact with your page is always going to be more impactful than just the specific keywords, both just in terms of your conversion rates and in your overall branding, um, but also in terms of SEO. Um, plus, Google likes to penalize content that it feels is only there for their benefit and is no actual value for a user. Um, for example, pages that have very little content or use their uh, keyword a little too often than is natural to be readable and usable, um, they'll penalize those and, and take those out of their rankings. Uh, so next up, site architecture. Um, site architecture can go a really long way um, to uh, helping your site rank better. And one of the most important aspects of site architecture is that one page performing well can ultimately benefit the entire site. And that's really important to make sure that we're getting um, domain authority out of single performing pages. Um, so exa for example, in the, uh, the site structure we have laid out here, by setting up subdirectories for SUVs, sedans, and trucks, this helps Google tell that an Explorer is an SUV and that a Fiesta is a sedan. And then having those subcategories helps Google determine that Ford.com is relevant to cars. Um, and because um, a rising tide floats all boats, is, if you will, for these uh, pages, when one page ranks well, it benefits the entire site. So if Explorer and Escape are both performing well, then Google starts to see Ford as an authority on SUVs, and the SUV page ranks better. Then if they were to add a third SUV to that category, that page would automatically get a boost because Ford is being seen as an SUV authority. And then if Ford ends up being seen as an authority on both SUVs and sedans, then Ford.com begins to be seen as an authority on cars. Um, and as Ford.com benefits, then trucks or any other new categories they add will get a boost, even if those pages haven't performed particularly well on their own. Uh, and one important thing to note is that Google views subdomains as separate websites. So SUVs.Ford.com gaining authority would not benefit trucks.ford.com as much as it does in this example here, where there are subcategories on the same root domain. So unless you have a really good reason to separate domains, such as a completely different experience like a shop, uh, keep everything on one domain whenever you can. Okay. Next up, page speed. Um, pretty simply, both Google and users love really fast websites. So this is a win-win all the way around. Um, for every two seconds your site takes to load, your bounce rate increases 50% and your conversion rate drops 12%. Um, so th some things you can do to make sure your pages are fast. Uh, make sure your images are optimized to reduce file size and load time. Um, look into potentially using a content delivery network if you have a particularly content heavy site. Uh, content delivery networks are geographically distributed proxy servers that help shorten the time that it takes to load content. Um, lazy loading is a great solution for image heavy sites, um, especially if you use them along with the alt tag so that Google can get a quicker view of what is in an image. And lastly, limit the amount of JavaScript that shows and hides content. Um, if you're using JavaScript to make it look like it's snowing on your website, that's fine. Google doesn't care. Um, but because Java script pages require an extra step in Google's crawl and index process, um, they need to be rendered. And because rendering can be expensive, when you're, especially when you're talking about rendering the entire internet, Google ends up crawling those pages in two stages. So they first come to your website and they're gonna crawl the HTML, um, which they can index relatively quickly. And then they come back later to render and index the JavaScript content. And 
there are no guidelines really around how long it takes for Google to come back to index that content. Um, it could be weeks. So if you have a page that is entirely based on JavaScript content, Google can come index that page and see no content on the page and you're not gonna get uh, the SEO value out of that page. Um, so any content that requires JavaScript to load um, may not be indexed. Um, try to make sure as much as you can, as much content as you can have loads as fast as you possibly can without the JavaScript or make sure the JavaScript is fast. Um, Google PageSpeed Insights is a really great tool that will um, give you feedback on how Google sees your site and give you recommendations on ways you can make it faster. And then also Google has a mobile friendly test application that is really useful for seeing how Google renders JavaScript on your pages. So you can tell whether or not your content is being indexed based on how Google is rendering that JavaScript. Okay. Uh, mobile friendly, I hope this one is pretty clear because hey, it's 2020. Uh, but Google wants to make sure that mobile experiences are good regardless of if the search is done on mobile or desktop because your search history matters. So if people are performing well on and engaging with your mobile site, that benefits your desktop site. Um, and it benefits your domain authority. Uh, obviously it matters more if the search is done on a mobile device, um, but, it, but Google wants to see that, uh, that experience, whether or not it's on a mobile or a desktop. Uh, and how that mobile experience is created does not matter. It could be responsive or it can be a completely separate mobile site. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, so just make sure that your page loads fast on mobile, it's readable, the images are loading correctly. Um, AMP, which stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages, is a relatively new HTML framework um, that Google has is really um, invested in. It helps create faster, smoother loading mobile pages. Um, if you do a search on your phone and click on an article, there's a pretty good chance that you're reading an AMP version, <clears throat> which might actually be hosted by Google. Um, Google really likes AMP uh, because it's fast, so they will um, prioritize those pages that have the AMP markup. Um, and again, the Google mobile friendly test, um, which can help you with the, your JavaScript rendering, um, also is great for uh, testing your pages to make sure they're mobile friendly. That's obviously the name of the tool and what it was originally built for. Um, so it will give you feedback on things that you can do to improve the mobile friendliness of your page. Um, okay, so duplicate content, because Google wants to make sure that content is useful and trustworthy, um, Google generally um, will devalue content that is duplicated in their index. Um, but there are some cases where we want to duplicate content, such as if we want to cross promote um, an article between different sites, or if we want to run an A-B test, or if we have multiple languages um, with translations of the same page. Uh, Google provides markup for each of those situations to help us specify the original version of that content so that Google knows which version is the original one that should be indexed and doesn't penalize you for having duplicate content. And in the case of multilingual pages, there's a uh, markup that will help it help you point to each uh, variation of the page and each translation and which language it's in so that it can serve the appropriate um, translated page to the appropriate searcher. So if someone is searching in Germany, it knows that um, even though we generally rank the English page, this person should see the German version. Uh, another thing that you should always look out for is um, many sites will um, load both their www dot and their non www dot versions of the pages. Um, and it really just depends, which one you get really just depends on what you type into a browser, both work. Google will actually see these as separate duplicate sites. So you need to make sure that all of your, um, whichever version you use, whether it has the www or it doesn't, make sure that the other one is always redirecting to the appropriate one. Otherwise it looks like duplicate content to Google. Um, structured data is a way to mark up information on your site so that it shows up directly in the search results. Um, you might see it often when you're looking at maybe movie reviews and it shows the reviews directly in the 
um, in, in the search results. It'll show the listing with the number of stars, as you can see in that glass door listing uh, in, the, in the screenshot. Um, if you go to schema.org, uh, they provide a lot of markup to for different situations to help you figure out which uh, which aspects that you can put into the search result pages. And Google really likes these because it makes that information more easily accessible, which is part of their mission statement. Uh, it can also be used on other platforms. It's not just specific to Google. Um, some social media sites will use it as well. So it's a, a useful way to make your listing stand out a little more, both for the user and for search engines. So Google really likes that stuff. Um, internal linking is, it, it can be kind of a pain because it's a little nitpicky sometimes, but it's also very important because it's how bots find content on your site. Um, any link they can follow, they add to their list of pages to crawl and index. So we need to make sure that our links go to places they're supposed to go to. Um, first and foremost, that means make sure you don't have any 404 errors on your site. Google hates 404 errors because they're terrible for users, and they also waste their bandwidth for the crawlers. Um, but we also want to make sure that all links to active pages go directly to the correct URL um, so that you get a 200, 200 response, as opposed to having a similar link that automatically redirects to the correct page, such as missing a trailing slash or maybe have, um, linking to the non-secure version of the page. Um, these are things that the user probably won't notice, but a crawler will. So having all of your links go to the correct page makes a difference for them. Um, and when we're moving or deleting pages, uh, we need to make sure we update all of our internal links to go to the right page and then use 301 redirects um, either to send that traffic to the new page or if you're deleting that page to the most relevant page. Um, when a page is 301 redirected to another page, most, but not all of the authority of that page will transfer to the new page. You're, you're gonna lose between five and 15% of that page's SEO value when you redirect it to the new page. So in general, especially for high performing pages, it's best not to change the URLs if you can help it. And just to reiterate, make sure there are no internal links pointing to 404. So there are some really great um, tools and browser plugins that you can use to crawl your sites and find all those 301s and 404s and fix them. Uh, a couple other uh, simple ones that are pretty basic but very important still. Um, first is robots.txt files. The first thing a crawler does when it comes to a website is check for a robots.txt file. Um, these always live on the root, dom on the root domain, so they should be solemn.com slash robots.txt. And they provide instructions for the bot, um, such as pages it should and shouldn't index, and also where you can find the XML sitemap. Uh, it's a good idea to block the crawlers from pages that you don't want to be indexed, um, especially if you have maybe backend support URLs or file repositories, um, or maybe pages that you need to log in to see, things that shouldn't be in the search index, you can prevent the crawlers from uh, indexing them in the first place. Uh, XML sitemaps let crawlers know what pages are on your site that should be indexed and when they were last updated. Um, they aren't required, but are highly recommended. Um, because without one, crawlers will only crawl the pages that they find through internal links on your website. So some pages can end up getting missed. Uh, you can include multiple sitemaps uh, for your site and they can be submitted directly to Google through the Google Search Console, which makes it a lot easier for Google to tell what is supposed to be indexed and what pages they should be looked at and how recent that uh, content is. Uh, a lot of CMS platforms will have a tool that will automatically update XML sitemaps as new content is created or updated. Um, so I highly recommend uh, using one of those so you don't have to keep going back and re-uploading uh, robots.txt files. And lastly, SSL is pretty standard now, um, but Google does factor that into their search rankings and will uh, give a boost to any site that has it. At the moment, they don't penalize sites for not having it, uh, but I think they probably will in the, in the near future. So SSL is um, something that should be standard at this point. So rule number one, and if there's one thing I, I want you to take away from this today, please let it be this. Do not get penalized. Google penalizes the sites that it feels are trying to game their system, and the results of that can actually sink a business. 
Um, I've seen a $25 million business get dropped to a $10 million a year business because they were penalized by Google. It's really not worth it. So be very, very careful. Um, two of the main areas Google cracks down on are poor content, um, where content is thin, uh, duplicated, um, unnatural to read, has too many keywords in it. Uh, and then the second one is unnatural link profiles. So Google strictly forbids um, buying or soliciting links in order to boost your rankings. So if your uh, if your backlink profile seems unnatural, uh, they'll penalize you. And those those penalties can be really really crippling. They can really knock out most of your uh, web traffic. So if you're an SEO contractor or an agency. Uh, make sure they are what they call a white hat in their methods so that they're not trying to do anything to, to deceive Google um, and risk putting you into their, uh, into their penalty box. Uh, be wary, especially if they mention link building and what tactics they're going to use because that's a, that's a slippery slope to penalties. Uh, make sure that they're doing things that are above board for Google. Uh, my personal mantra here is that Google has 1,500 PhDs on staff they're smarter than me, uh, play by their rules. Uh, so I want to dive into a little bit of the SEO tools that are out there. Um, there's a lot of them because as we said, SEO is big business, uh, but they mainly exist in two categories, site health and keyword research. Um, there's also a number of tools that Google provides that are really useful that I called out separately here. Um, site health tools um, will generally send their own crawlers through your site and report back to you so that you can optimize what a bot is seeing. Um, so you can fix 301s and 404s. And we'll also usually do keyword optimizations to say, hey, you're missing a keyword in this bot or you're missing an H1 tag. Um, they'll also crawl your competitor site so you can see what they're doing and, and use that for benchmarks or ideas for new keywords. Um, Screaming Frog is a personal favorite of mine. Um, it crawls sites through the, the internal links and returns that information on each page to you, including response time, metadata, um, stat responses, um, redirect information, all that stuff. It's a really useful tool. There's a free version that will crawl up to 500 pages on a site. And then there's a, a paid version that's about $100, $100 for the year. Um, I think it's very reasonable, extremely useful. Um, keyword research tools um, help you determine how much surf traffic there is around a particular keyword and help suggest new keywords. Uh, because ultimately, you really don't want to spend a lot of time optimizing for a keyword and setting up your site architecture only to find that nobody's searching for that keyword. Uh, Uber Suggest is one of my favorite tools, which actually uses Google's predictive search to help you find additional keywords that people are looking for. So if you type in pizza and it says pizza delivery, pizza near you, uh, pizza recipes, uh, it kind of it, it scrapes all of those suggestions and pulls them in to, to help you come up with new keywords and, and what people might be searching for. Um, and Google Search Console is an absolute must for health checks. Uh, it allows you to track backlinks to your site, uh, submit site maps to Google, um, track your page indexing and how often the, the crawlers are visiting your site. And um, we'll also let you test um, how Google is seeing your pages and how they're being rendered and how the crawlers see them. Um, the mobile friendly test is a really good way to do that. Um, if your site has JavaScript on it and to make sure you, you are optimized for mobile. Um, so looking at the platforms we're using and how SEO is applied to those. Um, first, for any tool that you're using to put pages onto the web that you want to show in Google, um, first make sure that you and your con content creators have keywords in all the places that we've been discussing. Um, so that could be making sure that your CMS has fields for things like title and meta description, uh, and maybe restrictions to make sure that they can't get published without those things. Um, second, let your keyword strategy drive your site architecture, uh, because it's much easier to do that in the early stages than to try to go back and redo it. Uh, and lastly, do what you can to make your pages fast. Uh, for single page apps that use JavaScript um, or any JavaScript language like Angular or React, um, it becomes really, really important to give Google as much information as you can without using the JavaScript. So having accurate titles and meta descriptions and headers becomes that much more important so that they can tell what those pages 
are about without having to spend too much of their resources to render your page. Um, tools like Angular Universal or React Snap can help render content faster if, they, uh, if they're applicable to, be, to your single page apps. Um, and if you have a site that um, con where the content changes quite often, dynamic rendering is a pretty good option because it allows you to create a, a full client side experience with JavaScript for users um, while also giving as much content as possible to bots without having to come back and re-index re your JavaScript content later. Uh, so that's a really good option if that um, applies to your single page app. And again, use that Google mobile friendly test site to make sure you can tell how your JavaScript's being rendered. And also the structured data tool is a really useful um, development environment in it that I highly recommend using. So you can kind of test as you're going to make sure that uh, your, your content's gonna be seen by the bots. So the things that you can hopefully take away from this and take back to your, your, uh, your normal job. Um, first, make sure that any implementations for external sites you have coming up have an SEO plan. Um, it's much easier to do the keyword strategy beforehand and let that drive the site architecture than trying to go back and reorganize everything. Um, and then make sure that your site has titles and meta descriptions and all that great stuff and that your users can edit this. Um, do regular performance checks for speeds, uh, page speed and readability. There's some great tools like Lighthouse that will monitor your, your page speeds so that you can uh, catch any problems that come up early. And then just do an audit of your current site. Make sure your internal linking is solid. You have robots.txt and XML sitemaps. Um, you have solid page speed and your, your pages are um, loading well on mobile. And then make sure you have Google Search Console because that's a, a really useful stop for you to um, see how Google is ranking your site. And that is all I have for you guys today. Um, Appreciate you letting me ramble on about SEO. I enjoy talking about it. Hopefully this was useful and valuable for all you guys. And if you would like to reach out to me to talk about SEO at any point, please do. I, I really like talking about this stuff. Um, you can find me on Twitter, AS Holstein, um, or email me at andrew.holstein at Uh Thanks. Uh, with that, I will throw it back to David. Awesome. Thank you. Um, any any questions? Anybody want to chime in, ask any questions? Uh, I meant to actually announce that earlier, but my apologies. Any questions for Andrew? Hi, this is Dino. Thank you so much for that presentation. It's one of the most useful presentations I've attended in the last couple of years. So, um, so oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you you did such a thorough job and covered so much information in such a short time. So that's great. Um, I do. Thank have you. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, just working backwards from your presentation because I don't have it. You know, we don't have the slides to actually go backward on. Um, is it possible to run? You know, on the right side of the one of the slides, you had all the Google tools or um, mm -hmm. any of these tools. Is it possible to run these tools on some on and, and any on any website, like if I was trying to train myself on how to like check these things, or do I have to do it on my site? Like, do you need permissions to be able to access this from behind the scene? Nope, you can run these on any site. Uh, the only one that you need to have access to to uh, to make sure that you're not um, getting into somebody else's site is Google Search mm -hmm. Console. Um, that one you need to verify that you have ownership over either through adding a. Um, a a code to the header of a page or through uh, um, Google Analytics logins. Um, but all of the other tools that I mentioned, um, like yeah. the mobile friendly tests, the Google PageSpeed, the structured data tool, those you can put anything you want in those. Um, the structured data tool, you can also just drop in straight code. You don't even have to use a, a, an existing website. Um, and almost all of those third party tools, um, you can yeah. run any website you want through those. Um, a lot of them even position themselves as competitive research tools um, so that you can use them as benchmarks. And most of them, um, they'll, like, they'll ask you for your top three competitors when you, when you go set them up. That's true. You did say that you can use, they, they do also give you information about your competitive mm -hmm. sites. So yep. awesome. um, uh, also, uh, 
two more questions. I just want to write this, list them so that I don't forget. One is about the uh, penal, penalization. Mm -hmm. And the other one is about um, the backlinks. So for, is it possible? So it sounds like you actually have to actively do something to be penalized for your, for your, I mean, I guess if you have no content, that's one thing or very low content. But you have to take actually specific actions to like stuff keywords or something in yes. order for Google to, to penalize you. So, so you can't just innocently get penalized on, other than having like zero content or very low content. Correct. Okay. Right. And having no content or zero content isn't going to get you penalized. It's just not going to help you rank. Whereas there are a lot of sites that they actively remove from their search results because of these penalties. Um, sure, and you really have to go out of your way to try to do that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've so you won't. Seen... You will not accidentally penalize yourself. Okay. Good. Because yeah, I've certainly seen pages that you know will just list keywords. That's all they list. Really enough, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then for backlinks, you know, some some sites I've seen have sort of like ring of websites where everyone links to each other as part of like some kind yeah, of grouping. Yeah. 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 Um, what is, What are your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so that's, uh, that's referred to as a, a link wheel, where um, basically there's two spokes and you know, everybody links to two other sites and they hope that by having um, enough, uh, enough of people in this network, it'll be harder for Google to track down that they're all linking to each other. Um, mm -hmm. Google generally devalues links where the sites link to each other because they're trying to avoid the kind of situations where someone reaches out and say, hey, if I link to you, you link to me, we both benefit. Um, Google doesn't really want it to work that way, so they devalue those links. Um, but Google's gotten really good at tracking down those kinds of link wheels. There used to be uh, a pretty big business of kind of link networks that people would yeah. pay to join. And for a while they worked really well and it was really easy to get backlinks. And then Google cracked down on those and they really figured out which ones were selling links and they, they cracked down hard on them. So, you know, maybe if, you're, if your network is big enough, maybe you can get away with it. Again, I, I think that Google is smarter than most of the, the average link builders out there. They're gonna track those things down. Good to know. Thank you for all yeah. these answers. All right, awesome. Anybody else? Any other questions? Did you mention that uh, this recording would be available to us or no? Or yes. Yeah, this will, um, we, we did record the session. It'll be up uh, probably within the next few, few days. Uh, we'll spin up a YouTube channel and I'll share it through uh, Meetup. Yeah, and you know something that was really helpful was the you know some of the tools that you shared. So I'd appreciate if you can share that either on the uh, the meetup site or just share the deck. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was very informative, and I actually took notes on some of those tools you you recommended and started signing up for some accounts. So. Thank you so much. <laughs> you're going to get a whole lot of emails soon. A yeah. lot of, you're on a lot of lists. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so usually we would um, dive into uh, community announcements, other events, things like that. But um, we don't have much of that right now. Uh, we would even try to do a raffle and give away some free stuff. But we haven't figured out how to do that effectively digitally yet. So sorry, none of that just yet. Um, but what we can say is that we will be planning on having our next session May 19th. Um, so that's the, should be the third Tuesday of the month, I hope. Um, if I did the math right. And not entirely sure as to what the content is going to be yet. Um, if any one of you are interested in presenting, um, by all means, reach out. We can um, talk through that. Um, we're looking for speakers for the rest of the year. Uh, we're trying to do every month here, um, even with, with COVID. Um, amidst us right now uh, we want to try to keep this going as as much as possible so if any of you have any topics you want to cover let me know um otherwise stay tuned on meetup for our next session and with that um that wraps up our time together 
Um, the, my email is on this slide, not the previous slide. So if you have any questions about the user group itself, if you want to contribute, be a co-organizer, you want to present, interested in getting um, your company name up here as a sponsor, anything like that, let me know. You can reach out to me there. Um, and we are on Meetup, and that's on the Boston DXPT uh, Twitter handle as well. So uh, connect, connect with us on the socials. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming out. Greatly appreciate it. I hope everyone's staying happy and healthy uh, and hope to talk to you all soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.